welcome to Blackbriar Gaming. Today, we're going to look at the recent leaks we've gotten for Legions Imperialis. This is a very exciting month because while we won't yet get our hands on any tiny space marines, we will get to see how the game plays out in next week's White Dwarf. As the release day for issue 493 of White Dwarf gets closer, we're starting to see the exciting Imperialis content within. We've got army lists, missions, and rules. So let's take a look at what we've got so far. Just firstly, before we get into it, <clears throat> uh, as you can probably hear, I've been quite sick over the last week, so please excuse my creaky voice and any coughing that we have throughout the video. But let's get into the spicy leaks. So the first thing that we saw, and we saw this yesterday, time zone pending, was the two army lists from the White Dwarf. That is the Strike Force Argent Spear of the Blood Angels and the uh, spoilers, just spoilers it might be on the turn of that page there, of 147 Gamma. So, Blood Angels, love it. <clears throat> this is exciting because I don't think we've seen the rules yet for these two forces. There's also some Emperor's Children thrown in uh, and we get to see those in the Battle Report, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's look at these two army lists. So we have 3,000 points here or, or close there too, which is obviously what Games Workshop is putting forwards as the kind of standard game of Legions Imperialis. <clears throat> and as we can see, these are huge forces. There's a lot of miniatures here, uh, as there should be. That's the whole point of epic scale, right? But as you can see here, we've got an absolute plethora of tanks, some air support in the form of interceptors. There's also some cheeky fire rafters down the bottom. There's a Reaver Titan thrown in. There is a whole, what they've called a Sky Hunter Phalanx, which is amazing. Jet bikes, Outrider squadrons, different types of land speeders, uh, and then on top of that, just a full drop pod assault. Just um, just an epic, massive drop pod assault. I'm loving what we're seeing here in the amount of miniatures that you're bringing to the table and just the diversity of these two armies. I found that in 28 mil Horus Heresy or whatever we want to call that now, um, there's just the armies start to kind of look the same. And certainly in that competitive scene, the armies start to amalgamate into, I mean, you need some line troops, right? There's there's good line troops and they're not so good line troops. You're probably not gonna take too many tanks because they're pretty average. Dreadnoughts are great, so you're gonna have some of them. Headquarters pretty much speaks for itself. Heavy sports sword's great, so chuck that in. And at this point, you, you know, and, and like specialist units as well. You probably want a close combat specialist unit of some sort, maybe a shooting specialist unit. And at this point, all the armies start to kind of look similar. They meld. There are some legions which buck that trend. Um, if someone goes very uh, jet bike heavy on white scars, for instance, maybe that looks a little different. If someone goes very tank heavy with some iron hands, maybe that looks a little bit different, but both those armies certainly haven't been particularly popular that I've seen recently in tournaments. Uh, <clears throat> and those armies that are popular, they all kind of look a bit similar with little, little differentiators here and there little directions people go, but because you can only fit so many miniatures uh, and also you only want to paint up so many miniatures and play with so many miniatures for a 28 mil game, they all look similar-ish. They'll play similar-ish. Whereas when we get into a system like we're seeing for Legions Imperialis, these armies can be wildly diverse. Uh, so if we look at the Blood Angels here, they've gone for a really fast force. They've gone for a full drop pot assault on top of that. There's a really big tank aspect to this army and it's very light on actual feet on the ground and when i say actually light i mean how many how many little detachments of troops are we talking about there how many bases one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirty four nine, two. it's still about i don't know what 25 30 little little bases of troops times five ish still talking a hundred plus marines on the table um from a from a foot stomping perspective and then all the marines on those bikes and land speeders and inside all those tanks Plenty going on, uh, and it just looks great. I love this army. So that's that's the Blood Angels. If we look at the points, we start to see some really cool points breakdowns for all these different units. You can just see how cheap some of these things are, and that's a little, I've got a little bit of a concern. So if you look at, for instance, at a Terminator detachment, you get six bases of Terminators, sorry, five bases of Terminators for 65 points. Now you'll see that when we look at the Death Guard list, uh, they've actually got if we look at the Solar Auxilia, uh, the uh, the Velitaris Storm section, which is, I believe, only four bases of, of basic humans um, that are gonna they're gonna do their their best, but essentially that's that's forty points. 
uh, and they're just, if they come up against some Terminators, noting that I'm pretty sure, and I could be wrong here, I think the Velotaris are close combat troops, right? If I'm not, this will be embarrassing. But if those if those four bases came up against the five bases of Terminators, noting there's only a 25 point difference between them, I'm pretty sure they're going to be in a lot of trouble. But is 25 points a huge differentiator in this game? Maybe it is. Um, but when you've got 3,000 points to play with, it certainly doesn't seem like a lot, but maybe it is. Maybe it is between the different units. Um, certainly... The points are really interesting. A Reaver, a Titan, for instance, is, is at your 400 point level. Um, you can get six jet bikes for only 70 points. Fantastic. Air units um, are very expensive by the looks of it. So two Fire Raptors is 200 points, where to put that into perspective, uh, you're getting six Predators for pretty much that same, that same point level, six tanks for that same point level. So they've costed uh, air units quite highly. I really want to run an aviation themed um, Space Marine White Scar Army with a lot of Xiphons, a lot of Fire Raptors, a lot of Storm Eagles, with even some Thunderhawks in there. So I'm hoping they're not overcosted. We'll have to wait and see what they can do. I imagine their speed and their ability to fly on and off the table has been factored into that points cost. But at the moment, they're looking super expensive, and I hope not too expensive for what they can achieve. But we'll find out. Uh, I just love that you have essentially what looks like a company of space marines coming down and drop pods for like 300 points. That's <laughs> just wild. When you're playing 3,000 point games and you've got a company of space marines coming down for 300 points in drop pods. Awesome. That's awesome stuff. Uh, so, got some points. Great to see. Uh, this army just looks absolutely fantastic. It's so themed, so diverse. Just love it. Let's jump over uh, and compare that to the Death Guard army. So, the Death Guard army is made up uh, quite differently. We can't see it as well as we can the others just because of the fold of the page here. But essentially, they've gone a lot more Dreadnought heavy uh, with the Death Guard. They've they've done their units differently. So, the and it'll be really great to see how this plays out. So, all of their, their tank squadrons or whatever you want to call them. Yeah, that, that works. Their Predator squadrons, their Kratos squadrons. Um, they're much smaller. So, they haven't gone for the big, you know, five or six tanks within a squadron like you see over with the Blood Angels. They've broken them up into, into twos and threes. It doesn't seem like there's much points penalty for this. Certainly with the Kratos, 150 points for those two Kratos. We saw uh, if we, we flick back to the Blood Angels, or if we, we think back to the Blood Angels, it was five for 350. So I guess, I know, six, six for 350. So you're not saving any points there at all by going bigger. Now, I don't know war gear dependent. Maybe the Death Guard Kratos are packing some heavier firepower. We can't quite see, or at least I'm not going to zoom in enough to see here. Uh, but yeah, so it doesn't look like, as with 28 mil Horus Heresy, you're getting much of a bargain by going big. And I don't, I don't hate that. Um, so that's fine. Um, we've got some Xiphons here as well. There's some Storm Eagles. So still some Air Sports and Fire Raptors. That's great. And what the Death Guard have done, so they've gone quite Dreadnought heavy, and it'll be great to see how those Dreadnoughts do in the game. Um, but they've also included some other types of detachments from other factions. So you've got the Emperor's Children Demi Company here, which is really cool. And in the way that the rules work out for some of these factions, you're actually going to get quite a benefit, I think, from including different types of factions. We'll see soon one of the Death Guard's rules is they just get to make certain areas of terrain dangerous. Now, I don't think it matters how big your Death Guard detachment or, or part of your force is, I think you still get that role. So mixing and matching, there's going to be certain benefits to that. Hopefully there is a benefit to going full on uh, one particular legion. I don't think there will be the way most of the rules are written. We'll wait and see. But great to see uh, just some differentiation here. I know personally, I'm a bit of a hobby butterfly. So I like to flick between uh, different color schemes and different types of forces. So yes, I don't know if I'll be able to put together 3000 points of just one legion. I might get a little bored. So good to know I can uh, and chuck some different types of paint schemes in there and different units from different legions. They've also included, uh, as I mentioned before, a Solar Auxilia Pioneer Company down there. A little hard to see, but it's got some tanks. It's got a bunch of rapier batteries, um, a commander, and that storm section that we talked about. And then just, just thrown a cheeky Reaver in there as well. So very different type of force. Um, a bunch of rhinos is how they're getting around as opposed to drop pods. Once again, not very troop heavy either, as we can see. <laughs> and I dare say, 
we won't see too many very troop heavy armies in this game uh, as opposed to Horus Heresy. So it'll, it'll be nice to see it mix up. And the, the reason for that, I dare say, is just because it'd be too hard to, because they're so cheap and a hundred points for, for a tactical detachment, pretty much can get even cheaper if they don't have rhinos. Um, trying to fill out 3,000 points with just footslog and marines, it's going to be impossible to fit them on the board, uh, let alone paint that force up. So it's going to be really nice to see some very tank-heavy, air-heavy, dreadnought-heavy, um, titan-heavy armies kicking around, which will just make it a very different game, uh, just from that, that perspective, if not many others, from your 28 mil Horus Heresy. So that's the armies. Um, they look amazing. Can't wait to see them clash. Let's now take a look at what else we've gotten. So we've gotten a couple of, uh, a few of the pages from the actual battle itself. Now here is the armies deployed on the battlefield. So instantly you can see that looks a little crowded. We've got the Death Guard uh, and, and Emperor's Children with their Solar Auxiliary and Reva. Reva. So just, you know what? Just a smattering, smattering of all kinds of traitors on this side and then, and then across from them, the Blood Angels. The greenish squares you can see on the map there, that is the dangerous terrain that I talked about from the Death Guard. Uh, and in fact, Legion Special Rules, they talk about it here and we haven't seen these special rules before. So let's just quickly look at that. So the Blood Angels benefit from Encarmine Fury, which allows them to move up to three inches after winning a combat. That sounds great. The Death Guard have the Sons of Barbarous Wool rule, which means they can make two areas of terrain into dangerous terrain. Exciting. And the Emperor's Children have Exemplars of War, which enables them once per game to choose to win the initiative. Now, once per game doesn't feel fantastic. I really hope Emperor's Children don't get screwed here, but winning the initiative also might, it is probably really important um, as well and could actually really swing um, the battle for you in a particular phase. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But those are some new special rules, which we see, which is lovely. We get a good look at what a battlefield is going to look like for this game. At the moment, looks pretty crowded, right? There's a lot of miniatures on that table that isn't that big. So following the trend of Warhammer 40k, they've gone for a five by four, I believe, table here. Now that seems pretty small, especially when you've got 6,000 points of Legions Imperialis packed onto it. I really want this game to be about maneuver, right? And when your units are packed in like this, they can't, <laughs> there's nowhere for them to go. Um, getting to your opponent's side of the table, obviously, with fast units will be, will be advan advantageous. Um, but with this many units and on a table this size, I'm not getting the maneuver vibes that I want to get. So it may be that I prefer to play on bigger tables, and I'm sure that's an option that, that everyone will have. It may be that I play at smaller points levels. 3,000 seems like a lot, certainly to start with. Um, so maybe start with 1,000 points, maybe 2,000 points. Um, but it'll be really interesting to see how this game plays out from a maneuver perspective and how that comes into it. We do know the mission um, and what the mission is for this. We'll talk about that in a second and, and my thoughts on that versus some other missions that we've also had leaked. But firstly, getting into it, so, uh, what, what else, what else can we see here? So the, uh, it looks like 12 inches, um, between the objectives there from what I understand, uh, we've seen some movement values already on the units. Um, so getting to objectives is going to be a huge part of the game. I'm not going to try and read those tiny bits of text. I don't think we really need to. We can all wait for the white dwarf to that. So let's flick over, um, to kind of mid, mid what I assume is, yep, there you go, round one. This is at the end of round one, I assume. So the planes, where the, uh, the planes, calling them planes feels wrong. The, uh, the air assets of, of the Legion forces have flown in on round one. They're sticking around on the table. I can't remember if they're meant to fly off at the end of round one. Maybe they're not. Maybe they just kept them on here for the picture. Either way, uh, I don't think they fly off instantly, right? They fly on and then maybe they fly off the next round. Maybe they stick around if they want to. But either way, um, we can see that all the drop pods, all the aircraft have come on round one. And there's, uh, there's another talk about this, I think, in one of the missions. But essentially, your reserves don't play out in this game, game like they will in 28mm. Uh, you're not going to be turn two rolling and really hoping... 
<laughs> that those reserves come on, um, they will be coming on and they will be having an impact. So there's a lot less risk with uh, with keeping large sections of your force in reserve, in bringing aircraft, in bringing deep striking units, um, which is great because it just means um, when there's less risk like that, you can make more diverse armies. Uh, so many units in Horus Heresy, there's just, there's too great a risk to deploying them in a certain way or, or using them um, so they don't see play. Whereas in this, I think the rules are written in a way that encourages all kind of units to, to get on there. And because the scale's so big and there's so much going on, you can take those risks a little easier as well. Having a having a bunch of drop pods and some guys coming down is just a tiny fraction of your force as opposed to your entire battle plan when you're playing 28 mil. But what can we see here? So let's look around. They talk about the orders phase, the first fire, advance, march, charge, and fall back. That's been covered in an article before, I believe. Uh, let's see, 16 drop pods registered uh, on his tactical readout. Amazing, and dropped down all over the place. So you don't have to put your drop pods all in the same spot. We can see here the Blood Angels have spread them around the battlefield, including getting into the back line there. Um, just love it. Um, the movement here, you can see that Reaver in particular has just flown up the table, which is great. Great to see that it's stomping, stomping all over the place, and it's not going to be sitting on that back line, just, just relaxing. Movement's big. Movement's big. They'll get across the table. It's going to be all over the place. Um, this is cool. I just love to see it. It looks fantastic. There's units going everywhere. Uh, and hopefully the carnage is just epic. Um, but let's now talk about, now that we've had a look at what the battle report is going to look like, and I can't wait to read the rest of it. And look, if spoilers come out for all of it, I'll probably stop at this point um, because I want to actually read it in the White Dwarf that comes out next week as opposed to, to reading it and squinting on my computer screen. It just doesn't have the same feeling. Uh, so now let's talk about some missions. So the mission that we see uh, playing out uh, is, I believe, uh, and this may not actually be true. So the missions that we've got, let's have a look actually, hang on, objectives in this secure and hold mission. All right, so we haven't had this mission spoiled, but let's see if we can read that. Um, there are six objectives that are placed. This is for the battle report. This is the mission. Two each in deployment zone and two in neutral territory. Victory points are awarded at the end of each round. Love to see it. Now, I was pretty concerned because one of the missions, extra missions we've had spoiled called Suffer No Rivals. Um, that is not at the end of each round. That is at the end of the game, the objectives are scored. But it's great to see GW, uh, unlike with Heresy when it first dropped, second edition, <clears throat> they are doing objectives at the end of rounds, at least for some of the missions. Uh, I think it's such a better system. It encourages maneuverability. It encourages um, ta actual tactics, not just killing your opponent and grabbing stuff at the end of the game. So I love it. Love the secure and hold mission that we're seeing in that battle report with progressive objectives. Uh, one of the other missions, though, that we've had spoiled, Suffer No Rivals. So this involves... Um, once again, six objectives, fantastic, spread throughout the, the battlefield uh, in a very equal way. There's nothing worse than a, game, than a mission, unless it's narrative, right? Where either the attackers or the defenders are, are fighting against the odds. But there's nothing worse in a battle that you just meant to play at a tournament where right from the get-go, one of the players is disadvantaged with objectives. It just sucks. So they've learned their lesson here, it seems. And the objectives are placed nice and equally across the board. And then you've got some priority targets. Um, so uh, starting with the attacker, each player selects two units from their army that are on the battlefield. This is at the start of the first battle round. So that's cool. So it's kind of once things are deployed. Uh, and that becomes a priority target. And essentially, if you kill a priority target, you get 30 victory points, as opposed for only five victory points for each objective marker you control at the end of the game. So that's going to that's gonna result in some really fun tactics excuse me, and some really fun games. Um, so I'm, I'm all about this. This actually looks like a lot of fun. Um, this will be more about, you know, assassinating those units and hunting them down while your opponent tries to protect them. Um, it's cool. It's cool. Um, let's see. Battlefield control. Um, yep. Ah, interestingly, um, and I'm not sure if battlefield control will be part of every mission. I don't think it will. But in this mission, if you control an objective marker at the end of your command phase, it remains under your control. So once again, I believe something they've, they've taken from 40K. And honestly, 40K 9th and 10th edition missions are absolutely fantastic. They're so well designed. And I'm so glad to see that finally coming across into, uh, into heresy. So... Essentially, yeah, you keep the objective even if you move on it, off it, which is great. There's nothing worse than having a really important unit sitting back holding an objective just because you kind of have to. Feels bad. It also feels bad um, 
taking armies based on the fact that you have to stay back. I mean, world eaters just taking some recon marines because you have to sit at the back of the battlefield and, and hold some objectives in certain missions doesn't feel great, right? Um, whereas this way, you capture them, you move on, and they're yours as well, as long as the opponent doesn't get behind you. Uh, and the fact that then opponents are encouraged to sneak behind each other and into, into the back lines and, and pull off some cool maneuvers is great as well. So it's encouraging all kind of awesome stuff that I love to see, just fanboying all over the place here. But this isn't the only mission we've had leaked. We have two more to finish up our leaks for today. Uh, we have the missions, and I believe these are the progressive missions, kind of linked missions, if you will, that <clears throat> the new White Dwarf has around essentially a linked campaign linking up um, Horus Heresy 28 mil to Legions Imperialis and maybe another game system. I'm not sure. I haven't read into it <coughs> too much yet, but we do have the two Legions Imperialis missions. There might be more, uh, but we have two of them from that kind of linked campaign, which is such a cool idea, uh, fighting on the big scale and then and then coming down into that 28. And it may be that Zone Mortalis is the, is the third part of that. We'll have to wait and see. But coming down into that, that more, you know, um, tactical level fight, uh, and then whether it be kicking down doors in, in Zone Mortalis, I'm sure we can make of that if we want to. Uh, but starting at the big piece here, mission one, it's the opening engagement. Uh, and this also has those, um, those progressive round scoring of, of objectives. Um, so we can see here the scoring at the end of each round, each player scores three victory points for each uncontested neutral objective marker they control, and one victory point if one or more enemy detachments were destroyed during that round. Great. Very victory point, and that's detachments, right? Enemy detachments, those are big formations. So this is very much an objective game, which I love to see, um, and you're going to have to be moving to the center of the table to get them. Uh, they are not in your backfield. You cannot just sit back and chill out. You have to get into it. You have to move forward. Um, love it. Love everything I'm seeing. Uh, stage, noting that these are not, I believe, in the core rulebook of Legions Imperialis. These are just in this White Dwarf. So please, people, if you are going to play Legions Imperialis, do pick up this White Dwarf coming out next week. I think it's going to be a really important one to grab. Just for, just to play these missions, um, even if you're not doing the linked campaign, just to have some extra missions to play is always is always handy. Um, let's see. They've got stage deployment, which is, uh, which is great. So essentially vehicles, super heavy vehicles, knights, titans. Um, <coughs> mm. Feeling great. Uh, they're coming on at the start of turn one, and by the sounds of it, but starting in reserve. Um, let's see. Unless specified otherwise, detachments with the vehicle type can arrive in the first round, while all remaining detachments arrive in the second round. So your Titans, for instance, um, who may be a little slower than your than your tanks and your flies, that makes sense, uh, they can arrive from the second round onwards. So they're not going to be just blasting things off the table right from the start, which is really nice. It's an opening engagement after all. Then establish beachhead. The winner of this battle, uh, this is cool, and this is how it links up. So the winner of this battle can include up to two defense line fortifications in their army for the next battle. Um, they don't cost any points. Uh, one of these lines can include an emplacement Sky Reaper battery. That's a bit of fun. So they, they link and they provide a bonus in some way. <coughs> mm, yeah. Now, look, I don't love... Uh, campaigns where the winner gets a benefit because you just get a bit of a snowballing effect. Um, I prefer to see it a bit of a balance and, and them do things a little differently. But hey, they're trying, people. They're trying to give us some narrative action and some campaigns that link. So the second piece that we have is Mission 3, um, which is back to Legions Imperialis. So I'm assuming that Mission 2 got down to the nitty-gritty 28 mil style. And now we've, we've, we've drawn back up. We've come backwards uh, to that larger scale for Mission 3 of this linked campaign. So let's have a look at it. Scoring. At the end of each round, each player scores one victory point for each uncontested objective marker. They control, sure, three VPs uh, in the neutral zone. Yep. And five uh, in their opponent's deployment zone. So once again, really encouraging you to get forward, capture those midfield objectives. It seems that shooting armies that just want to sit back and pound at the enemy are not going to do very well in this game, uh, especially because weapon ranges are tiny uh, in comparison to what we've seen in a typical war game. Um, if you sit in your back line and wait for the enemy to come to you, um, you're not going to win games. And I love that. The special rules here, at the end of each round, if a player controls more neutral objective markers than their opponent, uh, blah, 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 they have models, yep, um, they control, they, ha they get the implacable special rule. Sure, don't really know what that is, but great. <clears throat> and victory bonus. So this is if they win it for the next mission, maybe, um, they can select whether the night fighting mission rule is used in the next battle. I like that. It's not overpowered, right? 
Oh wait, here we go. In addition, if every enemy model within the commander special rule has been deployed in the next battle after deployment, the winner of this battle can roll 1d6 for each model in their opponent's army. Uh-oh. With the independent... Uh-oh. Character special roll. Uh-huh. On a 4+. plus. <coughs> the model <laughs> suffers one wound. Oh, Well, that's a bit much. It's a bit much, DW. Too keen. Too keen, people. Uh, okay, look. That is what it is. It'll be a bit of fun. We'll all get to have a bit of a laugh. Sure. But uh, but the knife fighting one's fine. I mean, that's just that's just some flavor, uh, as opposed to just trying to wound all of your opponent's headquarters units. That's, that's a bit much. So, those are the leaks that we have seen. Lots of cool stuff. Love what I'm seeing for Legion's Imperialis so far. I'm still up in the air. Whether I jump all in on this, it's so hard to decide. I uh, I was so keen back in August when this was going to actually release in August. Um, I was definitely on there, but now that the old world draws closer and closer, I don't know if I'll have time for it, but it's, it's for a while I was saying no, but as we see more, it gets harder and harder to say no to this game system because it seems like they're doing everything right and they're designing it in a way that just really tickles my game of fancy. But that is enough, and it brings us to the end of our Heresy Chats for today. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know in the comments whether you think the Lightning Fast Blood Angels will snatch victory, or if the Indomitable Death Guard will crush the Loyalist forces under their implacable advance. Make sure to keep rolling those dice and getting hyped for Heresy.